Welcome back to the conclusion of The Three Investigators and the Secret of Terror Castle. Last week, as we left off, Pete and Jupe went back to the castle and were captured by two men as they were looking for the black, blue phantom. Let's see what happens. Chapter 16 Prisoners in the Dungeon Presently, the blue phantom faded out and was gone. Darkness like a blanket pressed down on Pete. He tried once more to riddle free and only got himself more tightly tangled in the big net. What a fix, he thought glumly. Instead of nabbing a harmless old fellow who was playing at being a ghost, they had been nabbed themselves. The two characters who had netted them had looked tough enough and they had obviously been ready and waiting. Pete thought of Bob and Worthington waiting for them down at the canyon road. Would he ever see them again? Would he ever see his mom and dad? He was feeling as miserable as he had ever felt in his life when a light beam began bobbing across the room towards him. As he came closer, he saw that it was an electric lantern in the hand of a tall man. This one was wearing the long silk robes of an oriental nobleman. The man reached Pete and bent over him, shining a lantern in his face. Pete could see his cruel slant eyes and mouth full of gold teeth. Small fools, the man said. Why could you not be sensible and stay away, like the others? Now he must take care of you. He drew a finger across his throat and made an ugly noise. Pete got the message. His blood ran cold. Who are you? he asked. He stuttered a little, getting the words out. W what are you up to? Ha! the man said. To the lower dungeon! He picked Pete up like a sack of potatoes, threw him over his shoulder, and started back the way he had come. Slung over the man's shoulder, Pete couldn't see much in the almost total darkness. He knew why they went through a door, down a passage, and then down a very long flight of winding stairs. They came in a corridor that felt damp and chilly, and went through some more doors, and wound up in a small room like a cell. A dungeon cell. They were rusty ring bolts attached to the walls. Something white, like a cocoon was lying in a corner. The smaller Arab sat by it, sharpening a long knife. Where is Abdul? The Oriental asked. He dumped Pete on the stone floor beside the cocoon, which turned out to be Jupiter, still wrapped in the net which had caught him. He went to Zelda, the small Arab said in a deep guttural voice. She and Gypsy Kate are hiding the pearls. And we're going to take a vote on what we shall do with these puppies we have caught. I say we just lock them under in this cozy little room and leave them, the second man said. No one will ever find them, and soon the old castle will be ready, really haunted. <laughs> it's not a bad idea, the Arab grunted. But just to make certain, we ought to let a little blood first. He ran the edge of his knife along his thumb, and Pete, watching him, swallowed with difficulty. He wanted to whisper to Jupiter, his stocky partner, but he was lying so still beside him that Pete was afraid he might be hurt. I'll go and see where Zelda is. The Arab sheathed his knife and stood up. He cast a glance at the two bundles on the floor. Come along and give me a hiding hand hiding our tracks. These fish won't get out of the nets very fast. You're right. We must make haste. The tall oriental hung his electric lantern on the wall so that it clearly illuminated the two boys. And then the two men hurried out, and Pete could hear the footsteps growing fainter. And then he heard a grinding sound as of a large rock being moved. And then silence until Jupiter spoke. Pete, he asked, are you all right? It depends on what you mean by all right, Pete told him. If you mean no broken bones, yes, I'm fine. I'm dandy. I'm peachy pie. I'm glad you have not been injured, Jupiter sounded very upset. I must apologize for leading you into an unsuspected danger. I was too sure of my own deductions. Oh, it could happen to anybody, Pete answered. I mean, it sounded so logical. Who could guess we were going to run into some kind of gang? 
especially when we didn't find any traces outside of anyone using this place as a hangout. Yes, and I was so sure Mr. Terrell must be the one who was responsible, Jupiter said, that it never occurred to me to suspect otherwise. Tell me, can you move your hands? I can wiggle my little finger if that's any help, Pete said. I'm all tangled up in these meshes. Well, fortunately, I have the use of my right hand, Jupiter told him, and I'm making some progress towards freeing myself. Maybe you can help by telling me where to cut the next. Pete flopped over on his side. Jupe did likewise. Now that his partner's back was towards him, Pete could see that Jupiter had managed to get at a Swiss army knife that hung from his belt. Its eight blades included a screwdriver and a pair of scissors. Jupiter opened the tiny pair of scissors and had snipped several of the net's meshes so that he could get his hand out. Cut over towards your left, Pete whispered. You'll be able to get your left hand free. Yeah, yeah, that's it. The scissors were small, and the net seemed to be made of tough nylon. But with Pete directing Jupiter, he made progress. Soon he had both hands free. After that, he was able to make much faster progress. He was starting to cut the whole bottom half of the net when they suddenly heard footsteps. For a moment, they were too terrified to move. Then Jupiter's wits began to work. He rolled quickly over onto his back to hide the cut net, and they waited with pounding hearts. In a moment, a stooped old crone came into the room, holding an electric lantern high over her head. She wore tattered gypsy robes and had a huge gold rings in her ears. Well, my pretties, she cackled, <laughs> resting nice and comfortably. So you wouldn't take the warning that Gypsy Kate, good Gypsy Kate, went to so much trouble to leave you. And now look what's happened to you. Always heed a Gypsy's warning, my prickies. <laughs> and you'll be the better for it. Something about the stiffness which with which they lay attracted her attention, for she hurried directly to their sides. Tricks, my pretties, tricks! She cackled. Deftly, she turned Jupiter over and saw the cut net. Ma, ah, so that's it. The chicks want to escape. She grasped, grasped Jupiter's wrist and twisted it. The knife fell to the floor. She scooped it up. Now we must teach you a lesson, you pretty ones, she said and raised her voice. Zelda, she screamed. Ropes, ropes, our birdies want to fly away. I'm coming, Kate. I'm coming. A voice answered in English accents. In a moment, a tall woman, well-dressed, appeared in the doorway. She held the length of rope in her hand. You're clever, clever, the gypsy croned. We must tie them tightly, tightly. You will hold this one while I dress him up. Pete could do nothing but watch as the two women made short work of securing his partner again. First they cut the net loose from Jupiter, and they tied his hands securely behind his back. Next they tied his feet. Finally they ran a rope from his wrists to a rusty old iron ring set into a stone wall. Since the net that held Pete was still intact, they just wound the rope around him a few times and tied it well. Now they'll stay, Zelda, the old gypsy cackled. Ha ha ha, they'll never leave. I've convinced the men we mustn't be cruel. Oh no, we mustn't be cruel. We mustn't spill blood. No, we'll just leave them. And we'll close the door to this dungeon cell. They'll never tell what has happened. It's a pity, the Englishwoman said. They seem like nice boys. Don't go soft now, Zelda, the gypsy screeched. We voted, and you can't go against the vote. Hurry now, we must hide our tracks and be gone. She took the light from the wall and scurried out. The English woman held the other lantern and played its beam down on the two helpless boys. Why did you have to be so stubborn ducks, she asked. Everyone else got scared and stayed away. One little tune from the terror organ, and no one else has ever returned. 
Why do you have to keep coming back? The three investigators never give up, Jupiter said stubbornly. Sometimes it's more sensible to give up, the woman replied. Well, it's time for me to say goodbye. I hope you won't be frightened in the dark. I have to go. Bye. Before you go, Jupiter said, and Pete had to admire the way he kept his voice steady. May I ask you a question? To be sure, boy, to be sure, the woman said. What criminal enterprise are you and your confederates engaged in? Jupiter asked. La, such long words, the woman laughed. Why, young man, we are smugglers. We smuggle valuables from the Orient, mostly pearls, and use this place as our headquarters. For years, we've kept everyone from coming near it by making it seem haunted. It's the perfect hiding place. But why do you wear such noticeable costumes? Jupiter asked. Anyone who sees you is bound to notice you. No one sees us, young man, the Englishwoman said. And I mustn't answer all your questions, or you won't have anything to think about. Goodbye. Now in case we never meet again. And I don't think we ever will. She took the electric lantern and hurried out. As she slammed the cell door shut, darkness wrapped itself around the two. Pete felt his throat getting dry and his tongue sticking to the roof of his mouth. Jupe, he said. Say something. I want to hear some noise. I'm sorry, Jupiter sounded absent-minded. I, I was thinking. Wait, thinking? At a time like this? Why, yes. Did you notice that when Gypsy Kate left us a few minutes ago, she turned to the right and went down the corridor in that direction? No, I didn't notice. What difference does that make, Joop? Well, that's the opposite direction from which we came. So she's not going back upstairs into the castle. She's going deeper into the dungeon. That suggests that there must be a secret entrance somewhere, which would also explain why there's no sign of anyone going in and out outside. Whiskers. Even tied up in a dungeon and left to starve, Jupiter couldn't keep his gray cells from buzzing. I don't suppose you, while well, you've been doing all that thinking, Pete said, you've thought of any way to get us out of here. No, said Jupiter. I haven't. I can't think of a single solitary way for us to get out of here, unassisted. Please accept my apologies, Pete. I made a bad miscalculation in this case. Pete couldn't think of anything to say to that, and in silence, the two boys lay and listened to the tiny sounds in the darkness. Somewhere, a mouse scampered, and somewhere else, water was dripping. The slow drops, as they fell, seemed to be measuring off, one by one, the minutes that were left. Chapter 17. A Trail of Question Marks Worthington and Bob Andrews were getting anxious. They had been sitting in the Royals Royce for an hour, waiting for Jupiter and Pete to come back, but so far... There had been no sign of them. Every five minutes, Bob hopped out of the big car to look up Black Canyon. And every ten minutes or so, Worthington got out and took a look, too. It was like staring down the throat of a giant snake. Master Andrews, Worthington said at last, I think that I should go after them. But you can't leave the car, Worthington, Bob reminded him. You're not supposed to let it out of your sight. Master Jones and Master Crenshaw are more important than an automobile, Thurnton said. I am going to search for them. He got out of the rolls and opened up the boot. Bob was right beside him as the chauffeur picked out a big emergency electric lantern. I'm coming with you, Worthington, Bob said. They're my buddies. Very well. We shall go together. Worthington paused to take a heavy hammer out of the boot, and in case he needed a weapon, and then he started up Black Canyon. Because of his leg, Bob had difficulty keeping up with the tall, rangy chauffeur, but Worthington half-lifted him around the worst piles of rocks. In no time, they were at Terror Castle. They discovered at once that the front door had no knob and could not be opened from the outside. Then Worthington spotted the loose knob lying on the tiles. 
Obviously, the lads did not enter through the door, he said. We must look for another entrance. They ranged up and down the front of the place, flashing the light in the windows. Suddenly, Bob spotted the big question mark chalked on a French window, which was just slightly ajar. They must have gone in here, he yelled, explaining to Worthington about the three investigators' secret mark. They pushed the window open and slipped through. Inside, as Worthington flashed his lantern around, they could see they were in an old dining room. No telling where the lads went from here, Worthington said, looking disturbed. There are several doors, and none is marked. Then Bob spotted the big mirror. There was a question mark chalked in the center. They could scarcely have walked into a mirror, he said, but still, it has our mark. He grasped the front of the mirror, and to behind their amazement, it swung open like a door. Behind it, there was a narrow passage. A secret door, Worthington exclaimed. The boys must have gone through here, so we must do the same. Bob wasn't sure, was sure he wouldn't have had the nerve to go down that narrow, pitch dark passage by himself, but Worthington marched directly into it. Bob had no choice but to go along with him. Discovering the first investigator's mark on the door at the other end, they went through and found themselves in the projection room. Worthington flashed the light around over the decaying velvet drapes, the ragged seats, the old dust-covered pipe organ, but they could see no sign whatsoever of Jupiter and Pete. And then Bob noticed an odd gleam coming from under the seat. He reached down. Worthington, he shouted. There's Pete's new torch. Master Crenshaw would not have simply left it here, Worthington said. Something must have happened in this area. Search carefully for indications. They got down on their hands and knees in the aisle between the seats, and Worthington held his light close to the door. Look, the dust here has been disturbed over a large area. He was right, and in the middle of the place where the dust had been stirred up, there was a raggedy, chalked, white question mark. Worthington seemed upset when he saw the mark, but he did not tell Bob what he was thinking. Rising, he scouted around carefully until he found footprints in the dust leading around to the front of the seats and then behind the rotten movie screen and through a door behind it. Behind the door was a hall. A flight of steps wound down into more pitch blackness. The hall itself, however, went off in a different direction. As they stood there wondering which way to go, down the stairs or along the hall, Worthington spied a faint question mark on the top step. Down the stairs, he said. Master Jones is very resourceful. He has marked his trail for us. What do you think happened, Worthington? Bob asked as they trotted down the stairs that wound round and round until he felt dizzy. We can only guess, Worthington said, stopping briefly to inspect another chalked mark on a landing. If Master Jones had been walking... He would have placed his mark eye level on the wall. I am forced to conclude he was being carried, and that he took the opportunity to make the mark when the person or persons carrying him set him down to rest. He could possibly, probably touch the floor unseen. But who would have carried him down into the cellar? Bob asked in dismay. If it's a cellar, it looks, it looks more like a dungeon to me. It's exactly like a dungeon I once saw in an old English castle where I was employed, Worthington told him. A very unpleasant place. As for who may have been carrying Master Jones, I cannot guess. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost the trail. They had reached the bottom, three different directions, each one blacker than the others, and there weren't any more chalk marks. Let us, let us turn out the light and listen the chauffeur said. In the darkness, we may hear something. They strained their ears in the silent blackness, smelling the damp, musty air. And then, unexpectedly, they heard a sound like a rock scraping against another rock. A moment later, they saw a glimmer of light coming far from down the middle corridor. Master Jones, Worthington shouted, is that you? 
For a brief second, they saw a woman holding a lighted lantern, and then the light vanished, and they heard the sound of scraping rocks again. Once more, everything was dark and silent. After her! Worthington shouted. He dashed down the corridor, leaving Bob to hobble after him as fast as he could. By the time the boy caught up with the chauffeur, Worthington was pounding on a smooth concrete wall. The passage simply came to a dead end at that point. She went in through here, Worthington said. I'll swear to that. Stout measures are called for. Pulling the heavy hammer out of his belt, he began smashing at the wall. In a moment, they both pricked up their ears. One section sounded hollow. He gave that spot a few hard smashes, and the cement began to crumble. In no time, he had knocked a hole right through the wall. It was only about six inches thick there, made of cement on a wire frame. A secret door. When he found that no one else could get a hold on the door, Worthington began to yank back at it and forth. On the fourth yank, it came open, revealing another secret passage behind it. This one seemed to lead directly to the hillside. The roof and sides were formed completely of rock. A tunnel, Worthington exclaimed. Whoever captured the labs dis departed through this tunnel. That woman must be one of them. Quick, before she gets away from us. He tucked Bob under his arm to make better speed and started down the, hum down the tunnel. After a few feet, the passage became very rough and the roof dipped down so low that Worthington had to stoop to get through. As he was stooping, he knocked his lantern against the wall and dropped it. The light went out. While Bob was feeling around for the lantern, he heard a flapping of wings all around them, then excited squeaks and chirps. The next moment, something soft slammed into him in the darkness, and then another object flapped against his head. Bats! Bob yelled in alarm. Worthington, we're being attacked by giant bats. Steady, lad, Worthington said. Do not panic. He got down on his knees to hunt around for his light while Bob covered his head with his arms. Large, soft creatures were flapping all around them now, and one tried to land on his head. He gave it a wild yell and knocked it off. Worthington, he shouted. They're as big as pigeons. They're giant, giant vampire bats. I think not, Master Andrews, Worthington said as this light finally came on to him again. He aimed his beam upward, and they could see dozens of things with wings flying around them. But the things were birds, not bats. As soon as they saw the light, they flew towards it, squeaking and screeching in their excitement. Worthington snapped off the lantern. The light attracts them, he shouted to Bob. We'll make our way back in the darkness. Here! Give me your hand. Bob grasped Worthington's hand, and the Englishman, Englishman led his way back, groping along the rough wall. The birds seemed to disappear. At least in the darkness, they quieted down again so that the two investigators got to the door and back into the cellar of Terra Castle without any more interference. They closed the door to keep out the birds. I don't think the lads were taken through that tunnel, Worthington remarked. Their captors would have had to put them down to open the hidden door. Then Master Jones would have had a chance to leave a mark, and there is no mark there. There was no mark, but suddenly a voice started yelling, and there was no mistaking whose voice it was. Jupiter was calling for help. A moment later, Pete joined in. Their voices were coming from behind Bob and Worthington, and they were very muffled. The tall chauffeur hurried back up the dark corridor, and found a closed door which he had missed while chasing after the vanishing woman. Inside was a real dungeon cell with iron ring bolts on the door, on the wall. And there were Pete and Jupe tied up like Christmas packages. They didn't seem any too happy to be rescued either. In fact, they were annoyed that their yelling hadn't been heard sooner. As he cut them loose, Worthington explained that in chasing after the mysterious woman and hammering on the hidden tunnel door, he had made too much noise to hear their shouting. We must, we must get out of here at once and fetch the authorities, the English chauffeur said, while Pete and Jupe were dusting themselves off. These people are dangerous, and they left you here to die. But Jupiter wasn't paying any attention. 
He had pricked up his ears when Bob mentioned being attacked by birds in the tunnel. What kind of birds were they, Bob? He asked. What, what kind of birds? Bob yelled belligerently. I didn't stop to ask them. They acted like small eagles the way they came after us. Actually, they were harmless, Worthington said. They were merely attracted by the light. They seemed to be parakeets, Master Jones. Parakeets! The first inve investigator acted as if he had been stung by a hornet. Come, follow me! We must act fast! And getting the torch loose from his belt, he dashed out. What bit him? Pete asked as Bob handed him his torch. A clue, I guess, Bob answered. Anyway, we can't let him go alone. Definitely not, Worthington agreed. We must follow him, lads. They raced after Jupiter, who was already 50 yards ahead of them, despite his taped ankle. Pete outdistanced Worthington, who paused to assist Bob. As the two, as latter two ducked into the tunnel, they could see the other's lights bobbing along ahead of them going up and down and then round a corner of natural rock tunnel. They made the best time they could, ignoring the frightened parakeets that fluttered around them, in the same spots Worthington had a duck low to squeeze through. Finally, they came to a straight section of tunnel and saw the bobbing lights ahead come to a halt. They hurried along the final stretch and found a wooden door wide open. Stepping through it, they joined Pete Jupe and Pete in a big wire cage, surrounded by fluttering parakeets screeching in fright. We're inside the big cage where Mr. Rex raises his parakeets, Jupiter yelled to them. The end of Black Canyon must lie exactly parallel to the winding valley road, with only a few hundred feet of rocky ridge separating them. I never thought of that possibility. They start so many miles apart on the opposite sides of the mountain. Jupiter and Pete pushed hard on the wire door that closed the cage, and it burst open. All four squeezed out and found themselves just a few feet away from Mr. Rex's little bungalow. Through the window, they could see Mr. Rex and a small man with bushy hair playing cards, as if they didn't have a care in the world. We'll surprise them, Jupiter whispered. Extinguish all lights. They did, and they followed him silently to the front door. He pushed the doorbell. In a moment, the door opened. Mr. Rex stood in the doorway, glowering at them. For the first time, Bob had an opportunity to see firsthand how sinister he looked with his bald head and the awful scar on his throat. Well, what is it? Rex whispered in a menacing way. We'd like to talk to you, Mr. Rex, Jupiter said. And supposing I don't wish to be bothered, boy? In that case, it was Worthington speaking up. We shall have to call the authorities to investigate. Mr. Rex looked alarmed. Uh, no need for that, he whispered. Come in, come in. All four followed him into the room where the other man sat at the card table. He was a very small man, scarcely more than five feet tall. This is my old friend, Charles Grant, Rex said. Charlie, these are the boys who have been investigating Terror Castle. Well, boys, have you found the ghost yet? Yes, Jupiter said boldly. We have solved the secret of Terror Castle. He sounded so convinced that he startled both Pete and Bob, and they, if they had solved anything, no one had told them about it. Indeed, the whisperer said. And what is the secret? You two men, Jupiter said, are the ghosts who have been haunting the castle and scaring people away. And just a few minutes ago, you tied up Pete Crenshaw and me and left us in the dungeon under the castle. The whisperer scowled at him so hard that Worthington tightened his grip on the hammer. That's a very serious accusation, boy. Rex whispered, and I'll wager you can't prove it. Which was what Pete was thinking, too. Had Jupe got off the rails? Had he been tied up by an English woman and an old gypsy? 
looked at the tips of your shoes, Jupiter said. I marked them with our secret mark while you were standing beside me, tying me up. The two men looked down at their shoes. So did the others. On the polished black leather of each right toe was chalked the trademark of the three investigators. A question mark. Chapter 18. Interview with a Ghost. Both men looked startled, as did Pete, Bob, and Worthington. But, but, it, Pete started to say. They were just wearing women's clothes and wigs, Jupiter said. I realized that when I felt their shoes and discovered they were wearing men's shoes. And then I understood that all five of the gang who captured us were really just two men in different costumes. You, you mean the two Arabs and the Oriental? And the two women? They were all Mr. Rex and Mr. Grant? Peter demanded, dumbfounded. He's right, Mr. Rex sounded very weary. We were acting the part of a large gang to give you boys a real scare. The costumes with robes or skirts we could put on and take off very swiftly. However, I don't want you to think we actually intended to harm you. I was on my way back to untie you when your friends caught sight of me. We're not murderers, the little man, Mr. Grant said. Nor smugglers either. We're just ghosts. <laughs> he chuckled, but Mr. Rex looked solemn. I'm a murderer, he said. I killed Stephen Terrell. Oh, that's right, the little man said as if it had something that just slipped his mind, like forgetting to wind his watch. You did do away with him, but that hardly counts. The police may think differently, Worthington said. Lads, I think we should summon the authorities. No, wait, the whisperer held up his hand. Give me a moment. And I'll let you talk to Stephen Terrell himself. You mean talk to the ghost? Pete yelled. Exactly. Talk to his ghost. He will explain to you why I killed him. Before anyone could do anything to stop him, the whisperer slipped through a door onto the next room. Don't worry, Mr. Grant said. He's not trying to escape. He won't be a minute. By the way, here's your knife back, Jupiter Jones. Thank you, Jupiter said. He was attached to that knife. It was barely 60 seconds before the door opened again and a man came out, but this time it wasn't the Whisperer. This man was shorter and younger looking and had neatly combed gray-brown hair. He wore a tweed jacket and looked at them with a pleasant smile. Good evening, he said. I am Stephen Terrell. You wanted to see me? They all stared at him, not knowing what to say. Even Jupiter was silent for once. Finally, Mr. Grant spoke up. It really is Stephen Terrell, he said. And then Jupiter looked as if he had bitten into a nice juicy apple and found a worm left in it. He looked angry at himself. Mr. Terrell... He said, You are also Jonathan Rex, the Whisperer, are you not? Him? The Whisperer? Pete exclaimed. Why, he's not as tall, and he's got hair, and... At your service, said Stephen Terrell. He suddenly whipped off a wig and showed a bald head underneath. He stood very straight, making himself look much taller. He squinted his eyes, changed the set of his lip, hips, and hissed. Stand still if you value your lives. It was so convincing they all jumped. He was the Whisperer, all right. And he was also the movie star who had supposedly died so long ago. That much, at least, Bob and Pete were able to figure out. Mr. Terrell looked, took from his pocket a curious object. It was an artificial scar, made of plastic. When I attached this to my throat, took off my wig, and put on elevator shoes, I stopped being Stephen Terrell, he explained. 
I reduced my voice to a sinister whisper and became that frightening individual known as the Whisperer. He put his wig back on and looked like an ordinary man again. They all started to ask questions at once, and he held up his hand. We'd better all sit down, he said, and I'll explain. You see that picture? He pointed to the photograph on the table, which showed him shaking hands with the Whisperer. Shaking hands with himself, really. That was a trick photography, of course, to further the illusion of two totally different men. You see, many years ago, when I became a moving picture star, I found my shyness and my lisp made it very difficult to handle my business affairs properly. I hated to talk to people. I couldn't argue for my rights. So I created the character of the Whisperer to be my business manager. The Whisperer always whispered in a fierce tone, which hid my lisp, and he looked something so menacing I found no difficulty in dealing with him, anyone. No one, except my friend Charlie Grant here, knew that I was both men. Charlie was my makeup man, and he used to help me change from being Stephen Terrell into being the Whisperer. This scheme worked well until I made my first talking picture, and then the whole world laughed at me. It was a terrible blow to my pride. I withdrew to my home. I learned the bank wanted to take that away from me too. I became despondent and desperate. At time of my building the castle, the workmen had discovered a fault in the rocks of Black Canyon. The fault ran all the way through the ridge to the other side where Winding Valley Road ended. I had the natural tunnel walled up, but secretly installed a hidden door. Then, as Jonathan Rex, I bought the land at the other end of the secret passage and built a small home there. That way, I could come and go, and no one would suspect my double identity. Often, in those days, I went for long, solitary drives in an effort to shake off my deep depression. One day, I was driving high above the ocean when I conceived the brilliant idea of a faked accident. You drove your car off that cliff yourself, didn't you? Jupiter broke in. Terrell nodded. Yes. First, I wrote the note, leaving it somewhere where it was sure to be found. Then, one dark stormy night, I staged the accident, letting my car topple over the cliff without me in it, of course. And that was the end of Stephen Terrell, as far as the world was concerned. Also as far as I was concerned. To me, he was as good as dead and buried, and I wanted to keep it that way. I also wanted to keep my castle. The thought of anyone else owning it or living in it was too much to bear. Although the castle was empty now, I could enter it at will through the natural tunnel, so I was secretly on hand when the police conclude, conducted their search, and I made sure they all left in a hurry. When I built the castle, you see, I installed various devices in it for giving my friends thrills. Later, these were most useful in helping me to build the public impression that the castle was haunted. I even made more of a ghostly disturbance when the bank sent their men to collect my goods. Soon, it was scarcely necessary to do anything to frighten those who entered the castle. Their own imagination did it for them, but I made certain that the fearful, fearsome reputation of the building did not wane, and just to make the whole spot seem less desirable to anyone who might think ever of buying it, I occasionally rolled rocks down on the hillside to the road. My scheme worked. No one wanted to buy the castle from the bank. Meanwhile, I began to save money to buy it for myself, as Jonathan Rex a breeder of rare pet birds. I acquired almost enough money for a down payment, and then you boys came along. The actor sighed. You boys were much more stubborn than anyone else has ever been, he said. Mr. Terrell, asked Jupiter, who had been listening intently, did you phone us after our first visit and use a spooky voice to scare us? The man nodded. I thought it would keep you away. But how did you know we were coming that night? 
And, and how did you know who we were? Jupiter asked. The actor smiled slightly. My friend here, Charlie Grant, is my lookout, he said. The very short man nodded. Just at the entrance to Black Canyon, there is a small bungalow, barely visible. Charlie lives there. Whenever he sees anyone entering the canyon, he telephones me, and I hurry through the tunnel to be ready for them. When he saw the Rolls Royce go up the canyon, I recognized it from his description as being the car I had read about in the paper. And of course, I had also read that you were the one who had won the use of it. You boys left rather hurriedly that night. Don't feel badly about that. Others have left even more swiftly. I returned to my bungalow and looked for your name in the telephone book. Not finding it there, I called information and found that you did have a telephone. So I called you. Oh, Jupiter said, and Pete scratched his head. As Jupiter had said, answers to mysteries can be simple when you know them. But until you know them, they can seem very tough. That's why Skinny Norris, that is, those other boys, left in such a hurry the day Pete and I came to see you, Jupiter remarked. Yes, Charlie had warned me, and I was waiting for them. However, your arrival at almost the same time caught us unprepared. Little Mr. Grant looked embarrassed. I'd like to explain about that, boys, he said. When you drove up, it was too late for me to warn my friend Steve, so I slipped into the canyon by a side trail to keep watch. I saw those other boys run out, and I watched you chase them. And then I accidentally started a rock rolling, and you looked and spotted me. So it was you that were trying to catch, Pete exploded, and you sent that rock slide down on us. It was truly an accident. Mr. Grant said earnestly. The rocks were piled there just to push down on the road sometime when they might help discourage a prospective buyer. I tried to hide behind them and dislodge them by mistake. I was extremely worried that you had been seriously hurt, though I saw you duck into that rocky crevice. And then I saw the end of a stick appear through the dirt blocking the entrance, and I deduced that you were safe. I waited there until you were safely out, however. If you had encountered difficulty... I would have come to your aid. At this point, Pete couldn't think of anything more to say. At least Mr. Terrell's and Mr. Grant's explanations had cleared up several mysteries. It was easy now to see how the two men had managed to be ready for them every time any of the three investigators had entered the castle. But Jupiter was still scowling. I believe I understand most of what happened, he said but a few points still remain unclear. Ask anything you want to, the actor encouraged him. You've earned the right to know the answers. The afternoon we called on you, Mr. Terrell, Jupiter said. You had a pitcher of lemonade freshly made, as if you were expecting us. You also said you had been cutting dry brush. That wasn't true. There are small points, but I'd like to clear them up. The actor chuckled slightly. After you escaped from the cave, he said, you were too preoccupied to see my friend Charlie shouting you back to the car. He was hidden close enough to hear you give the chauffeur my address. As soon as you drove off, he telephoned me. I immediately got ready for you. From my window, I could see down into a stretch of winding valley road. The antique Rolls Royce with its gold trimming is a car very easily recognized. As soon as I saw it, I made the lemonade and then I slipped out into the bushes, carrying the machete as an excuse. I was watching you as you came up my path. At that point, I had not decided just how to handle you. I finally decided to be friendly, give you a cold drink, and to try to impress you with the frightening quality of Terra Castle, so you would stay away for your own accord. Remember, please, that I did my best to you, tell you as few untruths as possible. Of course, said that Stephen Terrell was dead, but so he was, in my mind. I also said that I had never entered the door of the castle again. I never have. I've gone and come through the tunnel. Having the entrance inside my cage of birds, 
I've been able to slip in and out without ever being noticed. Tonight I was in such a hurry, I left the door to open, and the birds got into the tunnel. Jupiter was pinching his lips again. The gypsy warning you sent us, Mr. Terrell, he said. That was your friend, Mr. Grant, dressed up as a gypsy woman, wasn't it? Exactly, my boy. When I learned you three were investigators, I knew you might be persistent. So Charlie made up a g as a gypsy woman and brought you the second warning. I did hope it would scare you into staying away. Hmm. It actually made me curious, Mr. Terrell, Jupiter said politely. No one has ever had any real warnings. I wondered why we were getting them. Ghosts don't bother to warn people, so I deduce someone didn't he want us in round Terror Castle. Then, when I studied the photographs Bob made, I noticed that the suit of armor in Echo Hall wasn't very rusty, and there wasn't much dust in your library. After so many years, there should have been lots of dust and rust. It certainly looked as if someone was secretly taking care of things in its Terror Castle. And the person the castle meant most to was the owner, Stephen Terrell. So I deduced at last that you were still alive, sir. Of course, you threw me off the track tonight by acting the role of a gang of international smugglers when you captured us. I believed you were an Arab, the Oriental and the Englishwoman, and Mr. Grant was an Arab, and the old gypsy. That is correct, Stephen I Terrell's eyes twinkled. We used part of my large collection of wigs and costumes. I wanted to give you a lasting scare. I thought it, that if you were worried about the vengeance of a gang of smugglers instead of mere ghosts, you might abandon your investigation of Terror Castle. But you were really becoming too much persistent. Well, that just about gives you the whole story. Is there anything else you'd like to know? There's plenty, Pete piped up now. For one thing, what about that eye that looked at us from the picture that night? That was my eye, Stephen Terrell said. There's a secret passage behind the paintings, and there was a peephole in the picture. But when Bob and I examined the picture later on, Pete argued, there wasn't any hole in it. After you fled, I hung another similar picture there, Mr. Terrell said, just in case just in case you came back to examine it. Okay, but the blue phantom? Pete asked. And the organ playing that weird music and the, and the fog of fear? And the ghost in the mirror? And, and the cold draft in the hall of echoes? I hate to tell you, the actor said. It's like a magician telling how he performs his tricks. It takes the mystery away from them. But you've earned the right to know. And if you really want to, I believe I may have been able to deduce some of the methods you use, sir, Jupiter said. The cold draft was a flow of gas from melting dry ice coming through a hole in the wall. And the weird music was a record played backwards through an amplifier. The blue phantom was probably cheesecloth covered with luminous paint. And the fog of fear was no doubt some chemical that makes smoke forced into the secret passage through the small holes. <laughs> You're right, boy, Stephen Terrell admitted. I suppose that once you realized human agency was behind the strange manifestations, you were able to deduce the mean method of creating the effects. Yes, sir, Jupiter told him. And the ghost in the mirror was probably a projection of some kind, but one thing I'm not sure of, how did you manage to induce the fear of nervousness and terror inside the castle? Please don't ask me to tell you everything, the actor begged. I'd like to preserve some of my secrets. As it is, you found out enough to ruin all my plans. I want to show you something. Look. He flung open the door through which he had ducked in to change himself from the sinister whisperer to Stephen Terrell. Within it, they saw a large dressing room, and there were tons of costumes of every kind hanging from the wall. Wigs were piled high on wig stands, and in one corner was an enormous pile of the sort of round cans used for storing motion picture film. There, in that room, 
the actor said. There is the real Stephen Terrell. Those costumes, those wigs, all those motion pictures stored in the cans, those are the real me. Stephen Terrell is just an instrument that transformed those costumes and those wigs into strange characters to provide enjoyable thrills for millions of people all over the world. For many years, Terror Castle was my last pride. There I was, still frightening people, instead of being laughed at, and all the time I was practicing, I cured my lisp. I managed to speak with a deeper voice like now. I learned to sound like a ghost, a woman, a pirate, an Arab, a Chinese, dozens of others. I dreamed of making a comeback. But as those years passed, the kind of motion picture I made was no longer desired. Now, scary pictures are often produced just to get people to laugh. Old pictures shown on television have funny voices and sounds added to produce laughter. And after I refused to degrade my talents to provide cheap laughter, Mr. Terrell was becoming quite excited. He slapped his fist into his palm and was breathing hard. But now, there is nothing left for me. I can't be the Phantom of Terror Castle anymore. I'll lose the castle itself. I can't be the Whisperer. I don't know what I will do. He paused to get control of himself. And Jupiter who had been pinching his lip practically, practically off, spoke again. Mr. Terrell, he said, do those cans in there contain all of the wonderfully scary movies you made, which no one has seen for many years? The actor nodded, looking at him. What are you thinking of? he asked. I have an idea how you can get your castle back and still go on entertaining people by scaring them. Jupiter said, You see, and as usual, Jupiter had hit upon an incredibly good idea. Chapter 19, Mr. Hitchcock Makes a Bargain The next morning, as Worthington and the Rolls whisked them into Hollywood to see Mr. Hitchcock, Jupiter didn't look happy. Pete knew what the trouble was. Jupe was still sore at himself for not deducing that the Whisperer and Stephen Terrell were the same person. The boys were visiting Mr. Hitchcock without Bob, who unfortunately had to work that morning. As soon as Worthington mentioned that the secret tunnel under Terror Castle was full of parakeets, Jupiter said, coming out of his deep meditation, I realized that they must be Mr. Rex's, that, in fact, the tunnel must end inside the cage where he raised his birds, and he had accidentally left the entrance open. But I still didn't realize that Mr. Rex was really Mr. Terrell. You had everything else figured out, Pete told him, even to the fact that Mr. Terrell was still alive. Though, for a time, you got thrown off the track. You ought to be proud of yourself, Jupe. But Jupiter shook his head. This time, there was no, getting, no trouble getting in to see Mr. Hitchcock. The guard at the gate waved them through, and in a few moments, they were seated in the famous director's office. Well, lads, Mr. Hitchcock rumbled. What have you to report? We found a haunted house, or Jupiter said. Ah, indeed. The director raised a quizzical eyebrow. And what type of ghost is it haunted by? Well, that's the trouble, Jupiter confessed. It's been haunted by a man who's alive and not dead. Hmm. That sounds interesting, Mr. Hitchcock settled back in his chair. Tell me about it. He listened attentively to the tale. When Jupiter had finished, he remarked, I'm glad to know that Stephen Terrell is alive. He was a great artist in his day, but I confess I'm curious to how he knew and produced the atmosphere of terror which filled his castle and affected everybody who entered. He said he'd rather not tell us, sir, Jupiter answered but I believe I can make a guess. I was studying a book in order to help my uncle assemble a pipe organ, and I came across a mention of the fact that subsonic vibrations, too deep and low to be heard, have curious effects on the human nervous system. It's my guess that among the pipes of Mr. Terrell's supposedly ruined pipe organ 
are several which emit these deep vibrations felt by the body's nervous system rather than heard. At a distance, the effect of the vibrations would be to make one nervous. Close up, a feeling of anxiety and terror would probably result, but naturally the effect would not extend outside the castle, a fact that my partners and I tested one evening. Pete shot his stocky partner a glance. So that was why Jupe had insisted that he and Bob visit Terra Castle that day. Pete was about to say something scathing, but Mr. Hitchcock started to speak again. Young man, he said, you apparently did a good job at ferreting out the secret of Terra Castle, but now that you have done so, what is to become of Stephen Terrell? It does not seem to me that you have done him any favor by uncovering his secret. Jupiter squirmed a little. Mr. Terrell has an idea, sir. In fact, he seems very enthusiastic about it. He's going to bank he's going to the bank with the money he has saved raising parakeets and arranged to buy back the castle. He has a plan, and I'm sure they will lend him more money when he explains it. You see, first he will reappear as Stephen Terrell, the long lost movie star and move back to the castle. There will be many stories in the newspapers, naturally. Naturally, Mr. Hitchcock agreed, eyeing Jupiter down his nose. And then what? Next, he'll open his castle to the public for an admission fee. He will show his famous old scary pictures in his private projection room. He will also let people wander around the castle, which will remain almost exactly as it is now. Tourists will go in there in great numbers to enjoy the films and to be frightened by the fog of fear and other devices Mr. Terrell has installed in the castle for giving people a harmless thrill. Mr. Terrell will also demonstrate in various costumes his portrayal of the sinister figures he played in his greatest movies. I'm sure it'll be a great success. Hmm. Alfred Hitchcock studied the stocky lad. I suspect, young Jones, that I detect your active imagination in the plan you have just set forth. But let that pass. The three investigators have done a commendable job. Even though you were unable to find me a haunts, house haunted by genuine ghosts, I will stand by my word and introduce your account of the case when it is written. Thank you, sir, Jupiter said. It'll mean a lot to the three investigators. If it's any consolation, Mr. Hitchcock said, the difficulty of finding a genuine haunted house proved so great that I have abandoned that particular project. But please tell me, what are your plans now? Pete was tempted to speak up and say that their plans were for a little peace and quiet, getting over the harrowing moments of that terror castle it provided. But Jupiter spoke first. We are investigators, Mr. Hitchcock. We will start looking for another case at once. The director eyed him shrewdly. I don't suppose you're planning to come back and ask me to introduce your second case when you get one, are you? He demanded. No, sir, Jupiter said with dignity. I had no such idea in mind. However, if you'd be willing to do so... Not so fast, young man, Mr. Hitchcock thundered, and Jupiter subsided. I said nothing of the sort, nothing whatever of the sort. No, sir. Jupe said meekly. The director glowered at him for a moment and then continued. I had in mind, he said at last, to suggest a case for you. An old friend of mine, a former Shakespearean actor, has lost his parrot. He was very much attached to the parrot. The police apparently are of no help. You have shown... I must confess it, a certain ingenuity. Perhaps you can help him find his parrot, unless, and he gave Jupiter and Peter a frown, hunting for lost parrots is too tame a task for the three investigators. No, sir, it was Pete who spoke up this time. If they had to go on a case, hunting for a lost parrot sounded to him like just as much excitement as he cared for at that moment. Our motto is, 
We investigate anything. We'll be happy to try to help your friend, sir, Jupiter said. Mr. Hitchcock smiled. It was a smile that might be hiding certain secret thoughts, but they could not be certain. In that case, he said, I will also introduce this case for you. Thank you, sir, the boys said in unison. But only on one condition, the director stated firmly. It has to be a case worth writing about. Obviously, simply finding a lost parrot, even if it is a parrot that stutters, is not enough to warrant writing a book about. If the case turns out to be simple and an easy one, naturally, I shall have nothing further to do with it or with the three investigators. Did, did you say the parrot stuttered? Jupiter asked his eyes already alight with interest. I did, the man stated. Did you also hear what else I said? Yes, sir, Jupiter replied. I've never heard of a stuttering parrot before. Come on, Pete. We've got our second case. One moment, Mr. Hitchcock said, and they paused. I believe it would help you if you had my friend's name and address. He wrote something on a sheet of paper. Here it is. Thank you, Jupiter said. He took the paper into his pocket and then started toward the door with Pete. We'll let you know how we make out, sir, he said, just before they left. Mr. Hitchcock watched them go with a slight smile. Quite a story, he thought. The Secret of Terror Castle.